after a good set of quarterly results. What are you most proud of? Well, first of all, I'm proud that we, uh, we made very good progress in the integration and so we significantly now reduce the risk of uh, the integration itself. And uh, we did that while uh, staying close to clients, uh, deliver very good financial results, uh, which makes me comfortable that we are on a good way to deliver on our uh, 2026 uh, financial targets. Of course, it's going to take a lot of time uh, to restore the profitability. Uh, because the uh, amount of uh, tasks to be done is, is huge, but I'm confident that we are on a good way to uh, deliver. Th there's always this overhang about the capital requirements that regulators are talking about. You've been very vocal about it. H how do you see it playing out? Well, look, uh, we uh, started uh, technical discussions uh, with uh, all interested parties. Uh, uh, we will uh, see how it, it ca comes out. I think that we are all for uh, making uh, the system uh, more resilient, uh, uh, more safe. Uh, on the other end, we have to recognize that the current system has uh, served us well, so, so much that uh, we were able to step in and uh, rescue uh, Credit Suisse. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to look at the lessons learned from this crisis, but uh, also on the other end, we need to ensure that uh, the outcome uh, is proportionate mm -hmm. and uh, is also one that allows us to continue to be a driver of uh, growth and well-being uh, for the Swiss economy. So y your biggest concern, I mean, at any point, could it touch dividend or shareholder buybacks? I don't think uh, this will happen. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in any case, it's premature to speculate on the outcome. I know that there's a number of ways, of course, of, of dealing with this if something big were to happen in this space. One of them is probably SRT deals. Are regulators, have they given you a green light on them? No, well, look, you know, I don't think this is, uh, SRT are something that can be used uh, in a focused and selective way to uh, manage uh, uh, economic risk uh, and not to manage uh, regulatory capital uh, uh, issues per se. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, I don't think it's, it's a solution. So, what, is there a solution that you're looking at to, to kind of minimize the impact on UBS? I think it's premature to speculate because we don't know really the outcome of uh, the discussions. Uh, we will find out uh, probably late uh, this year, early part of 2025, uh, uh, the direction of travel, and then we can make an assessment. Um, Sergio, talk to me a little bit about wealth management. So th there's been a number of, you know, high profile people. Iqbal, for example, is moving to, to Asia. What's your biggest hope for, for wealth in, and in what region? Well, uh, Iqbal has moved to Asia uh, with his family. So I think uh, we continue to see Asia, China and the U.S. as a big driver of growth. Uh, they are very important elements of our strategy together with our uh, position in Switzerland as a leading uh, Universal Bank, and uh, uh, you, you, you saw also in, uh, in, in, in the second quarter results, but overall that uh, Asia continues to be a, a pretty good uh, um, a secular uh, driver of, of growth for our business. What about the U.S.? The U.S., we are, um, I'm, I'm glad we are making good progress uh, with uh, some initiatives to um, uh, make uh, the IB and wealth management working closer together. This has helped. Uh, 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 our transaction uh, activities in, in wealth management. Uh, we, we are also preparing the platform to uh, institutionalize more of our client relationships. So, uh, and uh, now uh, with the new leadership team with, uh, with uh, Rob Karoski, we are really preparing for the next phase of, uh, of, uh, of our plans. And I'm confident that uh, we will uh, improve our results in the U.S. Uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, it, quite quickly, how aggressive do you want to be in the U.S. in terms no, of I think hiring? we have a plan and uh, we set our plan that we, we, we believe we need to get uh, uh, to uh, meet, meet teens, pre-tax pre profit margins in the next two, two or three years. And then uh, from there onwards, we will uh, look at ways to improve uh, further. But uh, it takes time to, to do that. Uh, you know, of course, the environment is not really uh, favorable. We need to do things with uh, uh, sustainability uh, in mind and not uh, just to aim to do quick wins. I mean, are you looking at potential acquisitions or will most of everything will be through organic? Growth? No, we have, to, we have to do our own uh, work and, and fix uh, the issues that we need to fix and, uh, and leverage better the capabilities we have right now and they are 
enough driver of growth and uh, for us in the foreseeable future. Do, do you see M any M&A on the cards? I mean, are you ready to acquire even something small? We are quite busy with M&A right now, so it's difficult for us to think about M&A. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, we have enough on our plate. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Sergio, when you look at the, the week that was, it, it was pretty volatile or actually pretty extraordinary f for markets. I don't know whether we still understand fully the underlying reasons, but has it changed the way that you see the markets in the next six months? Not dramatically, but I think, I, I guess for the markets and for many investors, uh, you know, what happened early on this month has been a wake up call, a wake up call, right? So, I mean, you look at the, the magnitude of the movements uh, should make think, people think uh, carefully about uh, uh, having a proper uh, diver diversification and uh, and and uh, being very thoughtful about uh, uh, the way you invest money. So in in that sense, uh, the fact that we uh, basically made back everything within uh, w one week or two cannot be uh, uh, taken as a you know temporary issues in my point of view. One has to really think that probably is a sign uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the f some elements of fragility in the system. But does it get easier as maybe we get a, a Fed cut or does it get more complicated as we go to the U.S. election? But look, you know, it, when central bank cuts, it depends how they cut and why they cut. So if, uh, if you know, of course there is now a capacity probably to accommodate cuts based on uh, lower inflation, but, uh, but it's also, you know, we need to watch exactly also what are the underlying economic drivers and uh, and to the extent that the Fed is forced to, to cut more aggressively because of economic downturns, that would not really be good for the market. So we, we need to really watch uh, why uh, rates would come down and, uh, and how, how quickly they come down. Uh, in general, we do expect uh, uh, and we see room for a potential uh, rate cuts uh, in the foreseeable future, but uh, I wouldn't really uh, be in the camp of uh, predicting that the Fed will go as far as the market wants to. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the Fed to go. Why is that? Well, because I think that uh, probably the market is used to see central banks stepping in every time and, and being very accommodative in the previous cycles. And I, th I think right now it's, it's quite clear that uh, central banks are focused also on inflation and, uh, and therefore they don't have so much capacity to go as far as uh, the market may want to see. Sergio, is, is the U.S. election the only game in town? <clears throat> I mean, it could change depending on who's in the White House. You know, regulation for banks, it could change even central bank independence, tariffs, trade wars. Yeah, look, yes, but if, if, if U.S. election would be the only game in town, we would be in a pretty good place in the world. So I think that uh, uh, administration changes every four years or so, and uh, we are used to do that, <laughs> to see that. So I think that unfortunately we have many other problems, particularly geopolitically, uh, humanitarian issues uh, we have uh, across the world. So I think that, uh, of course, uh, you have to expect a little bit of uh, volatility around uh, um, uh, the upcoming election in the U.S., but uh, it's, you know, it's not going to uh, it's not going to resolve uh, uh, all the issues that we have on the plate right now. So but I'm confident that, uh, you know, we, we are, for us, I mean, we have a business model that has been able to be to show resilience and actually success even in, in moment of stress, and that's the most important issue for us. But, so you're telling me what the world is changing because of these poly crises. Is that is that fair? And what does it mean for for a bank like UBS? Well, it means that uh, the necessity for us to stay close to clients and continue to advise and, as I mentioned before, help them to diversify and manage the risk, uh, it's, it's crucial. So, and that's the reason I believe that in those moments we are seen as a safe haven, as a place to go for advice and uh, I'm glad that our, our people uh, are doing that while also absorbing a huge task of integrating uh, Credit Suisse. So, and I, I believe we are ready for that kind of environment. Do you think it's also changing client behavior? There's been a lot of focus on, on private markets. How does that interplay? actually change and what does it mean for UBS? No, the big change in client behaviors we saw in the last 24 months was clearly more uh, 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 more, uh, more diversification towards uh, fixed income and so on and so forth. When rates comes down, of course, maybe 
part of it will go to search for higher yield in maybe in private credit, but uh, but not only. But we do believe that uh, as rates come comes down, you you will see also potentially people moving back to more alternative assets, uh, uh, and and also uh, which is important to understand. Uh, the headwinds we face in the industry, but also at UBS in NII, in, uh, in, in margins on, on uh, interest rates, will be also offset by uh, clients taking more leverage, potentially. So um, it, it depends how it plays out. It depends what are the underlying economic dynamics. But so do you worry that there could be a, a systemic risk or semi-systemic risk? I don't think Is so, no. I don't, I don't think, system, I don't see systemic risk, but Volatility does uh, high volatility doesn't mean that you have uh, systemic risks. But what, what does it mean? High volatility means you you need to be higher on the right volatility. Side of the train. I mean, to to be honest, I think if you look at high volatility is is a can be an absolute or a relative concept. <laughs> so, uh, because we have seen so low volatility in the last few uh, quarters, you know, I do believe that we're going to see higher volatility. If this is very high and permanently high, it's another matter, but I do believe we're going to see more volatility. So it can't be quarterly results if I don't ask you about hiring or, or actually job losses. Can you give us an update on what the next six and then 12 months will bring? Well, you saw that, uh, you know, the restructuring uh, uh, and, uh, and, and fixing um, uh, the elements of uh, problems in the integration are unfortunately driving uh, job losses. Uh, uh, we, we, are, we took down uh, around uh, 3,000 uh, at count this quarter, so I think that uh, we will continue to, have to do that in order to restore the profitability UBS had uh, before the acquisition.